Après plusieurs autres villes aussi différentes que Rome, Berlin, Ouest ou... Bollywood to Hollywood with Rao Rampilla. Today, we have a special guest from France. Producer, director, and you name it, you got it. Olivier, we're going to show you the audience so you were uh, one of your commercials so they know how good you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, could, we, could we run the commercial, first one? No, he's going to run the commercial. <laughs> Леонид Комаровский, новый любимчик президента. Учился капитализму в Гарварде, теперь работает в Кремле. А серебряная игрушка? Откуда она? Французская, называется Клио. Как говорят французы, «Эля тудин гранде». Говорят, на Западе ее можно видеть везде. Везде? Это роскошь везде? Коммунистический рай. The French new wave of directors rallied to support their mentor Henri Longlois in February 1968, when the French government, who funded the Cinémathèque, suddenly dismissed its eccentric director for incompetent administration. Messages of support came from filmmakers all over the world. On the 14th of February, 3,000 people turned out at the Palais de Chaillot to protest. On that fateful day in February 1968, events took an unexpectedly violent turn. It was really rather incredible. On the one hand, you had these kind of nerdy characters who were the film buffs holding up banners that said, film pas flic, films not cops. Uh, and suddenly there were these robots, these guys with their masks and their truncheons and their riot guns and their stun weaponry or whatever, and they suddenly charged. <laughs> Not only was I chased by the police and, and my fellow film bus, but Truffaut was beaten over the head and his forehead was bloodied and, and Godard was, was pushed around. And, and these were, you know, prominent personalities in French culture. I think in De Gaulle's France, the apparatus of repression in academia, in higher education, was probably stronger than anywhere else, and it was quite strong everywhere. At the Grand Match, the great uh, leaders of the schools of, of the University of Paris would have enormous power and, and students were kept down. And um, in the new University of Paris in Vincennes, where the troubles begin, I think the authorities are having difficulty inventing a new type of university for the great horde of new students who turn up. To help relieve the pressure of a growing student population, the government built a new university in the working-class neighbourhood of Nanterre. Here, 19,000 students are crammed into a modern but small facility, and they are daily elbow-to-elbow -elbow at cafes and on the streets with workers. The politics of the time, stirred primarily by growing protests against the US war in Vietnam, is creeping into the student population. The administration building is occupied by 150 students claiming to be anarchists. The university is closed until April the 1st. And so this is where you get the first clashes and the university authorities call in the cops. And um, the cops are used to dealing pretty brutally with demonstrators. Uh, they've dealt brutally with Algerian demonstrators uh, 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 in, in recent times. And, and so they wield their clubs and actually, before long, the whole clash spirals in the most extraordinary way. I think largely because of the media. Um, the, there are a lot of television people around in Paris at this time. There's the Vietnam 
peace talks going on in Paris. A militant student group forms out of the event, calling itself the March 22nd movement. One of its leaders is Daniel Cohn-Bendit. Following an action in April, Cohn-Bendit is arrested. 400 students from Nanterre go to Paris and to the Sorbonne to protest. Uh, I think there was something uh, there which reached out beyond the normal. Uh, the fact that the government, the French government, tried to deport him uh, because he was technically of German, uh, of German birth. Um, the fact that uh, hundreds of thousands of young French workers, as well as students, demonstrated using the banner, uh, bring back Combendi, we are all German Jews. He was a German Jew. Somehow they were revolting against stereotypes of nationality and race as much as stereotypes of consumerism and stereotypes of the uh, well-behaved student and worker. The police attacks wake up the student population and the 400 swells to several thousand. It takes five hours to quell the disturbance. This first means that more and more students come out, uh, uh, students who aren't necessarily political, but just think authority's gone mad and uh, who also feel stifled by gaullist paternalism. More than 100 people are injured, close to 600 are arrested. That week, tens of thousands of posters calling for action begin to appear in Paris. While the Prime Minister of France, Georges Pompidou, makes state visits to Iran and to Afghanistan, courses at Nanterre are suspended due to the Cone Bendit incident. Courses at the Sorbonne are suspended indefinitely. Meanwhile, two unions, the UNEF, and the SNESUP call for unlimited strikes. As the protests become battles, 600 students are hurt, 345 police are wounded, and 422 arrests are made. What had begun in March 1968 as a student revolt at Nanterre on the outskirts of Paris by May had become a nationwide protest against the French political regime. Major factories were closed down by strikes, and in Paris, students occupied the University of the Sorbonne. The clip is about confrontation, Paris, 1968. Industrial societies throughout the world are in ferment following two decades of growth and prosperity. As in the early 19th century, unrest begins in urban centers of culture. Berkeley, New York, Tokyo, Rome, Milan, Berlin, Prague. The ferment originates among the marginal, among those considered to be wards and dependents of society. France, the mother country of revolution, seems immune. So what you got to say for that? <laughs> the mother country, France, is not immune. And you know, at that time, everything was going around the world. There was a civil rights movement in uh, America, Berkeley campus, uh, uh, Columbia campus, NYU campus. And you have Prague and all those, Milan, Berlin, and all those places. So, but, but the French took the lead. And it's a very historic moment. 
Yes, yes. It's interesting because it was really something, as you said, which was happening everywhere. So it was uh, the, the whole society, not only in France, but everywhere, was changing. And it was changing with young people and not with, uh, not with uh, the, uh, the normal political game. Uh, I'm curious, how did it affect you as a 13-year-old? Did you, uh, I mean, I remember one time we had protests in India. I was kind of feverish, and my friends went and uh, threw cocktail bottles at the police. Uh, I couldn't go because uh, I had a high fever. Then my uncle came and said, good, he got a fever. So did you jump into the street or did you have an occasion or somebody restrained you? No, don't go or uh, how uh, did it feel and how, what did you do at that time? No, I was too young to go to the, to, to go to the big protest and the, the big uh, things which were quite violent and so on. Uh -huh. So kids, kids like me were not uh, really allowed. We could have, it, it was because it was quite violent, and it was uh, there was real fights between uh, the police and the students. Um, so uh, a young kid like me could not have um, his place there. But we were going. It was uh, funny because we were listening, and so on, so we knew that the night before um, it had been very hot, that they had burned a lot of cars, and so on. So the next day because we had no schools, schools were closed and so on. So the next day, during the day, we were going with some friends to see the result of what uh, had happened the, the night before. Uh, so it was our way uh, uh -huh. to, to participate, but uh, we really could not, uh, we could not uh, go to, uh, to the big game, unfortunately. But how, but how did this affect you and your generation of growing up? It really affected everything. Uh, after uh, May 68, everything was much more free. The way to talk, the way to, to behave in schools, in, uh, uh, in church for the, for the people who believed in something, uh, in the, the, the um, companies and so on. Everything was more uh, more free, uh, was more made with uh, a sense of humor. So you started to have uh, the titles of um, the first page of some magazine with, uh, with funny things, even to present serious things. Uh, that's the time, uh, you know Charlie, the mm -hmm. guy who was killed um, yeah. generally. Uh -huh. So it started during this, uh, those years. It was called Arakiri. Uh -huh. um, Okay, it was a magazine, it was a weekly magazine, or monthly at the beginning, and it was really very funny, and it was very, very, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, it was really breaking all the, 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 the laws of, of, uh, of uh, what you correctly must say, sing, present, and so on, and, and um, it was very, um, very good for everybody. I mean, e even the bourgeois. I was born in the bourgeoisie and so on. <laughs> <laughs> Not too strict, but still. And people were very happy that, uh, that things moved. They, they found their lives much more open, much more easy and so on. It was much more easy to talk about sexuality and it was not because, uh, as it was before. Uh, something which was bad, which was difficult, and so on. No, things were. Um, it was uh, make love, uh, not war, and, and so on. It was very, very good. You, you, you know, even the, the um, even the the, the, uh, the minister uh -huh. uh, of of um, of uh, one of the ministers, minister of police. Yeah, uh, uh, he said because one of the slogans, one of the um, uh, on on some posters of the students, it was uh, said, "I do revolution. More I do revolution. More I want to make love." And the minister of police put uh, on his um, on his uh, office. He said, "More I make repression. More I uh, want to sleep." <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, recently uh, there was an incident of uh, French uh, 
a head of the uh, IMF and he got into trouble in New York. And then he went back. He could have been the president, but uh, uh, the, see the thing and now I'm well, worrying about is what happened to recently uh, uh, Jesui, what is that? Jesui Charlie. Jesui Charlie uh, and, and then also uh, 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 it seems like students and the young people, they have nothing to fight for except for money or uh, yeah. you know fancy stuff. At, at least your generation has something to fight for, have dreams and aspirations. Um, you know, so watching back, it's kind of inspires things in a sense, see how dull life these young people have. You know, sometimes I feel sorry for them. <laughs> but yeah. you know, that, that kind of t tells me where we are going, you know, where this world and where this Western society is going. Yeah, it depends because uh, I, I think you are right, but it, it's also because uh, in France, we actually, like in some countries, we are quite um, free and, and so we don't need to fight. But you have quite the same thing happening two years ago. It was in Turkey. I don't know if you remember the thing about uh, Gezi Park. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those. Uh, uh, they wanted to destroy a park to make a shopping mall. Yeah. And the young people um, went to the park and they stayed there and so on. And it was, a, and it was I was in Istanbul at this time, and it was exactly the same spirit. So people were, uh, the young people, they were fighting, they, uh, but they were not violent. Uh, they had a lot of humor, uh, and they wanted the same freedom, the same freedom of uh, speech and so on. Unfortunately, in front of them, they had not uh, a guy like Pompidou, they had uh, Erdogan, who uh, was ready to kill people and not uh, not to talk. But I mean, the spirit of the people was the same. And maybe it was because they want the society really to, to change, because there are many things to be changed, to be more free and so on. Uh, in France or maybe in America and so on, we don't have so much to fight for freedom. We have the freedom. You can say what you want. You, uh, so the, the society is really not the same than before 68. I mean, 68 has made such a big change and, and which uh, really changes the, the, the society. So now the problems are not the same. Okay. Uh... Well, you have a, a Turkish connection. Your wife is from Turkey, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, it seems like you have uh, affinity. We, we will talk uh, uh, another, uh, in, in another episode about this. But, um, well, uh, I just uh, wanted to close this show maybe with uh, uh, the, the spirit of, uh, 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 spirit of Sorbonne. Uh, can we have another clip? Uh... Mike may have reminded people of the Paris Commune, but May 68 in France was the real thing. What began as a student protest for reform of the archaic, authoritarian French university system sparked a general strike that electrified the country. They were anarchists, most of them. That was the spirit. Uh, the slogan was all power to the imagination, uh, that you can do anything. You know, that we don't have to live with all the various forms of repression, which we're used to. So it was anti-capitalist, but that was just part of this general, complete sort of cultural revolution that the, uh, the French students were anticipating. And so it's interesting that although they were the furthest out in any way politically, that was also the one place where workers joined with students and almost toppled the government. May 10th, the night of the barricades. 20,000 students marched in the Latin Quarter. Police and students clashed. Street fighting went on for weeks. The rioting and marches of up to half a million people frightened not only President de Gaulle, but the French Communist Party as well. The old left thought this new left was out of control. They had impossible dreams. 
the two principal slogans, I think, were quotations from uh, Marx and Rimbaud. Uh, from Marx, uh, let us change the world. From Rimbaud, let us change life. Carlos Fuentes, the Mexican novelist, was an active participant in May 68, along with many international students caught up in the excitement. What there was is a sense of extraordinary uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, there was this capacity to embrace people in the streets. Uh, there were couples kissing. There were couples that fell apart because they did not share political views. Paris was divided by the River Seine as never before. On the left bank, you had the, the left, the revolutionaries, the dreamers. On the right side, you had the conservatives, you had the Gaullists, you had the fi financiers, the money people, the bourgeoisie. So the city was divided uh, as much as in uh, Les Miserables, in Victor Hugo, or in any of the great occasions of this city that seems to need a great uh, revolutionary explosion from time to time. Eventually, the May uprising subsided. The powerful trade unions controlled by the communists refused to take part and police kept up relentless pressure. But over time, the students did succeed in reforming and modernizing the French educational system, and they rejuvenated the Socialist Party, which a decade later became the elected government of France. It became a great, gigantic fraternal feast in which everybody was kissing everybody, embracing everybody, patting everybody on the back, and saying how happy they were and how free they felt. And this was contagious. It was marvelous, and I don't think we'll ever see it again. So he is saying what you are saying, Carlos. Uh, so what do you think? What do you have anything to say? <laughs> uh, no, uh, what is interesting, you know, at the beginning, in fact, when it was only students, uh -huh. uh, it, it was very sympathetic, uh, even if there was uh, some violence and so on. I think it became a, a, quite a real panic when it became political. So at one point, unions and so on joined, and it became a general strike. It, it started with uh, the French television. Until then, uh, the television was really in the hand of the government. And at one point, television, the French television said, fuck, we join, um, we join the students. And it was totally incredible for De Gaulle and so on. He could not understand. And then the strike was everywhere. And suddenly, people started to panic. And that's where, in fact, the, the movement ended, um, because people were afraid that it was going too far. And De Gaulle made something. He, he had not understood what was happening at the beginning, but he made something which was quite clever. It is that he disappeared for six days. Mm -hmm. And for six days, suddenly, because the good people liked him, did not like him, or but it was the goal, and he was really more or less the father of the nation. Uh -huh. And suddenly there was not father, there was no father anymore, uh -huh. and it was a kind of panic for for a lot of people. And so I think that the way uh, he, when he came back, people were afraid that the strikes were going to far and so on, and there was a big movement who made the thing coming in order again. It, it was quite interesting. I mean, even festival decons that year, they stopped, which yes. they never did in, in, in their history. Um, yes. You know, we can go on talking about it uh, for a long, long time. Absolutely. But uh, uh, I, think, I guess we have the time limitation, so we have to stop some point somewhere. So uh, thanks for coming on to my show, and thanks for educating me and uh, our audience. Uh, about your impressions about Sorbonne and the student revolution and the future, what it may be, especially after this. Uh, 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 I mean, something else is happening about this Greece also. Now you mm -hmm. have, just with Charlie, now Greece, there is a new leftist government uh, and they are protesting the economic issues. Uh, so we don't know which direction the world is going to go, so uh, especially the Western world. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any last words about that, or, or should I say thank you and goodbye? <laughs> uh, I thank you. I thank you for your interest, and uh, also we we uh, it would be very interesting uh, to um, hear more about your protests in in uh, in India mm -hmm. and 
it was uh, uh, I would like to to learn more about it. Uh, so maybe next time we we yeah I, I I I wrote a play about it Gandhi and Untouchables but I couldn't put everything uh, there but it's one day we'll sit down and talk or a cup of uh, say that gla glass of wine <laughs> uh, but thank you uh, thank you very much so let's end this. Uh, 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 there was a, 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 when I went there, the only protest I saw was by uh, sex trade workers. There is a clip. Uh, yeah. So I was from the balcony. I was, uh, so they were fighting for some equal rights or some trade union rights. Uh, kind of looks odd, feels odd for an American or for a third world person, but it shows so uh, your society has gone uh, further than most of the other societies. So what's your project next? Now from movies, now you are turning into, are uh, moving into writing the novels. Uh, yeah, I, I already wrote uh, novels. I've um, had, uh, last year I had two books published, a uh -huh. novel and, and another book about a French writer. Uh, in September, uh, this September, I will have a, a book published about or around the film Midnight Express. Yeah. Yes. Um, and now I'm uh, finishing a, a novel uh, which is set um, between France and Kazakhstan. And uh, it will be a film also. Um, so it, it's, I write it as a novel, but after I will uh, make a, a script out of it. Um, so that's the, the, the plan for now. And after I have a, another project with uh, with Danny Kuyate, uh, with whom I made uh, Soleil. Um, so um, we have some work. Well, you well, have you have a couple of novels uh, uh, that won some prizes, right? Uh, yes, this is um, uh, with a novel published in uh, last um, April, so one year ago. Uh -huh. uh, so far, the three awards. Um, so, um, so, um, so, what is next to you? You have studied law. You have studied art history, uh, and you made commercials. Uh, you made short films, and you graduated and uh, contributed feature films. Now you are becoming a novelist. So, are you going to act next, or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, or become a scientist, or become a musician. So, what is next to you, uh, uh, Olivier? I'm I'm happy with uh, writing and filming. If I can continue to to write and to make films, uh -huh. uh, I'm I'm very happy. Okay, whatever makes you happy will make us happy. So, wish you all the best, and thanks for coming under the show, Bollywood to Hollywood. Um, uh, I wish we had more time. We can go and talk a lot, but uh, the show is only for half an hour. So uh, until another show, um, thank you and goodbye. And, uh, I thank you very much, Rao. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, I'm very pleased to be from uh, Hollywood to Bollywood. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>